Hey gang, today's guest is Roger Joseph Manning Jr., keyboardist and vocalist for the San Francisco, California rock band Jellyfish. Together, we did our best to dismantle the beast known as New Mistake, their fan favorite single taken from the 1993 album Spilt Milk. This song is a monster and took me about twice as long to comb through than other songs I've broken down here on the pod. For a four-piece rock band, they didn't impose any restrictions on where they could go musically. Every bell and whistle that you can think of went into this song. The lyric was completely left of center from what I initially thought it was about, and it was a joy to hear Roger explain in detail what he felt his bandmate and lyricist Andy Sturmer was talking about. Lyrically, the track is about as cool and far out there as you can get. Roger went into great detail about what went into the thinking process when putting together Jellyfish songs. The tunes that they created 30 years ago are timeless, and if released today, wouldn't sound dated at all. They are a total testament to great songwriting, great musicianship, and great tones sonically, all combined with amazing production. And this may just be the first track here on Krista Makes a Podcast to use both castanets and a wind chime in the same song. For all this and a whole lot more, stick around. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista Makes a Podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista Makes a Podcast. Well, hey there, Roger. How you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. It, it's uh, it, it's my pleasure. I understand that uh, we were catching up a little bit before we, we jumped on here. You were at the Taylor Hawkins uh, tribute last night, uh, so I'm assuming you're you're in the Los Angeles area right now. Correct. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Mark Ronson was one of the guest performers, and he and um, Andrew Wyatt, who was singing, uh, invited me to be part of the rhythm section. I played keyboards and sang some backgrounds for a. We did a Jerry Rafferty song right down the line, which was apparently a, a Taylor guilty pleasure. That's awesome. You know, I, I first became aware of your band all the way back, uh, probably around 90. I remember there was a thing that, that uh, preceded MTV's 120 Minutes. I don't know if you recall, Roger, it was called Postmodern MTV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I believe that's where I first saw the video for The King is Half Undressed from your first uh, record with Jellyfish, Belly Button. Just loved it. Loved the imagery. Always thought you were uh, a Brit pop or a British band. Just from the <laughs> look, you just had this bombastic. Just it was like Alice in Wonderland meets Harry Potter meets the Beatles meets I don't know. It was just such a such a great look uh, for video, and just loved the band from the from the minute I minute I heard you guys. Well, thank you. I'm glad I'm glad you had that reaction. <laughs> it was it wasn't for everybody, and uh, obviously we were concerned uh in the best you know we, we we know that you only get a brief window to yeah. say what you need to say to the world musically visually we were having fun with it we ran with it being colorful and loud was an extension of our personality although we were very serious singer songwriters you know our as far as our craft was concerned but it was nothing more boring to us than just coming out in a pair of torn jeans and a t-shirt with our guitar strapped to our back and that wasn't an extension of who we are. So, yeah, that was a hell of a hell of a wake up call, though. That first video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and and you guys put your put your last record out uh, was '93, which was Spilt Milk, and the song we're going to talk about today, "New Mistake," is off that record. And you know, this was uh, right around the time that uh, whatever you want to call it, grunge hit, and. But at the same time, the 90s were just so wacky and weird that I thought you guys fit right in. I, I didn't think that it, that it was forced at all. And, and again, I, I love the imagery and everything you guys were about. I thought it was really cool. Yeah, that's, that's my generation. And I, and I liked a lot of the grunge that was happening. Uh, and yeah. we listened to plenty of it. That's just not what was an extension of our natural writing, even though we, mm -hmm. we rocked out. I mean, we didn't rock out the way Soundgarden does or something, you know. So sure. I was happy to see bands like 
the rentals and black crows and um weezer um i mean there were there were all kinds of groups that were like oh i've got the mic now you know what do i want to say um um and certainly beck who i later would you know tour with and record with and it was uh i, I liked that freedom uh obviously music and the marketplace has gotten so much more one-dimensional as far as what's given a chance to you know because back then like you said uh we debuted on uh, even mtv which was pretty much the corp you know they were the amazon of videos i mean oh yes that, they were the, really the only game in town besides commercial radio exactly you know and even they like had their kind of college rock sector so you could you could be a band and have a decent career without being Paula Abdul or Janet Jackson or something, you know, uh, on, on the radio that way, and do well touring, have plenty of commerce. There were all kinds of independent, smaller magazines that catered to you, and, you know, the hope was that you'd, you'd break through like an REM or something, but uh, even if that didn't happen, you could have a blast for a few years. And we were, you know, we were like, hey, we're, we're fine with that. We, we thought we wrote songs that were catchy enough to absolutely cross over but uh yeah it's things have become even more one-dimensional and, and so I, I look back on that time period you know pretty pretty grateful that all kinds of stuff was able to have a have a chance at least sure and it's interesting you mentioned weezer because they're one of the people that i had one of the bands i had written down that i feel was influenced by you i can hear some of your melodies and stuff that i i'm, I'm sure that rivers listened to you guys you know and a, another band that's a little more uh recent uh is panic at the disco they're mm. just this grandiose they got so much and i'm just like my gosh did these guys hear jellyfish and <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't want to uh, kiss up too much here. I, lo I love the band. I love the track. It's, this Thank is you. one of my probably favorite songs, uh, most interesting songs I've broken down in this show. And wow. I've been at it for over two and a half years now. I've, I've done a couple of these. And uh, <laughs> timeless is a word. You know, um, this song could be released today. It doesn't sound dated to me. It doesn't sound like it came from the 90s. It sounds like if a band did it and it was on the radio, uh, the mix is killer, the, the production's killer. It's, uh, <laughs> it's relevant now. Well, that, that always means a lot coming from an, another musician, especially one like yourself and your band. I mean, you guys have been in the trenches. You've done the work. You've like, you, know, you know what the roller coaster ride looks like. Sure. And um, something that was very important to us, you know, again, in spite of our age and our generation when we came out and had a chance at a major label and stuff was, I mean, Andy and I wrote a lot of songs together and one of the um, criteria, you know, had, had to pass one of the final tests was, does this song just have an inherent classicism to it? Kind of like what you said, which is, again, such a compliment. This could have been written at any time, in any era, because it's the, the melody that transcends all the different genres and trends and all those things. And that was very important to us. We just wanted to write hooks that people wanted to sing along to that, that, were, that were very lyrical. You know, I mean, when we came out and a lot of the grunge stuff, hip hop was reaching heights that nobody thought it would, would ever do. Right. It just kept getting more and more and more popular, which is a wonderful thing. I mean, we were listening to as much NWA and Beastie Boys as, as anything. Same here. <laughs> yeah, because it, 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 was, it was so good and so inventive uh, and so experimental and, and exploratory and just like it had all that great attitude and in-your-face realism of any good and, and fun, uh, like any good hardcore band. And I, I was, I, I still am, but at that time... Me and my brother, we grew up skating and going to Dead Kennedy shows. I mean, all, all that energy was put into the world of Jellyfish. Uh, we were very serious about our, our pop construction and our, our, our pop um, competition with, with other acts of the day or whatever. So having something that was classic in a sense was important to us. And I, I, I like the fact that my mom could sing along, but some college kid was at our show too going, you know, I kind of miss the Beatles, but I'm kind of discovering them now with bands like yourself and blah, blah, blah. And that's like, okay, well, mission accomplished then. I mean, that's all we were ever setting out to do was, was kind of continue on in that legacy of all those acts that had inspired us melodically, whether it was Cheap Trick or Queen or Beach Boys or 
you know, Buddy Holly. I mean, you just can keep going. And, and Everly yeah. Brothers. I mean, that's that, that's all we ever wanted to do. I've always told people that Straight Outta Compton is uh, one of the most punk rock records in my collection. I mean, it's Completely. just... Completely. <laughs> Without a doubt. It's just... It's it, it's great. I'm glad glad you uh, you, you talked about that. Well, I, this song I, I want to get into it. There's so much here, and the song clocks in at four minutes and three seconds. Uh, it's at a three four time signature, which what a swing and a swagger <laughs> that gives, and just the way that you guys are in that groove with this track. Uh, before Pro Tools, you guys went to tape with this, so you guys had to know how to play, and you could tell. Uh, we were fans of music. Andy and I met in uh, high school, and there were lots of other kids that were kind of coming together at the same time that were quite um, passionate about learning their craft. I mean, we wanted to be competent on our instruments, but there were so many wonderful things, as you may remember, happening in music and pop culture at that time in the early 80s. Uh, you had this insane like part two of the British invasion. You're getting like the second half... Of, of the British punk from the mid 80s but bands like The Damned are still happening Smiths are coming out Echo and the Bunnymen Susie and the Banshees I mean, it just goes on and uh, Gary Newman yeah, so much incredible stuff it was highly inventive but it was being done by young adults who'd grown up in the 60s with Sid Barrett and Psych Rock and mm -hmm. so and Beatles of course so as punky and arty as it all was it was still really rich in songwriting integrity and, and harmonic content and um, yeah. great melodies. Same in America, you had bands like Blondie and Devo and um, it, it just uh, Talking Heads, uh, you know. And so we were being inspired by that and simultaneously we were of the age where we were too young to have witnessed a lot of the progressive rock like Yes and Genesis and King Crimson and stuff when it first came out. But being 14, 15, you could kind of go back and rediscover it because it was only like six, seven, eight years old. So we're getting inspired by a lot of that too. And the more uh, intricate, you know, we all knew the world of Steely Dan and stuff, but we didn't understand that you can't have Steely Dan without the 40 years of uh, popular jazz music that had come before it. So we're just being inspired by all kinds of stuff. Frank Zappa, San Francisco had an amazing punk rock scene. Dead Kennedys were, were kind of oh, leading that. One of the best. Yeah. And so we were very lucky. We kind of took it all for granted at the time. Uh, you could take the bus into Berkeley and on Telegraph Avenue, right outside the campus, there were f uh, five used record stores. So you could save up your paper route money for the week, go there with t a mere $20 in your pocket and come back with 20 albums. And, <laughs> and, you could, and we'd all buy 20 different records and then we'd swap them over the weekend and tape each other's albums. <laughs> so on any given week, we'd like 50 records we're checking out. Yeah. And often we'd do things like, uh, I remember Andy would buy albums that just had his favorite drummers on them. And then we would discover like, well, I don't know, I've never heard of this artist or this band, but, you know, Simon Phillips is playing drums. Okay, well, let's check it out. We got really into the players and who were making up the records, both in England and in the States. And you would discover a lot of new music you'd never heard of that was four or five years old that you'd, that you'd missed, you know, because you were, you were too little and it wasn't in the, it wasn't on AM Top 40 radio. Yeah. So that inevitably led us kind of back into the history of jazz and becoming, you know, artists like Herbie Hancock were like bad names back then, like meaning that wasn't cool. You know, nobody wanted mm -hmm. to know about that. They'd call you a band nerd. And then you cut, you know, 12 years later... All the DJ culture is making, and hip-hop are making, oh, Herbie Hancock's the shit, man. It's like, wait, <laughs> yeah. you guys used to make fun of me for listening to that stuff. You know? Isn't that funny how that happens? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that was all going to add up to what was informing us when Andy and I started forming the, the basis for Jellyfish and realizing we loved the history of pop rock and what might that look like given our age what our contribution to that might look like. Yeah, and the reason I brought up going to tape and, and having to be able to play as a band before you could fix everything, you know, your band wasn't a studio creation. I know that because I listened to the demo <laughs> of this track. And, you know, besides some bells and whistles and production things, I mean, it's there. You better catch me when I fall
the idea is there. The song, the song is there, and uh, you can you can just tell that you guys you guys were players. I, I have a lot of adjectives here, and this one of them I wrote at the very top here is just it's just a lush sound. That's one of the words words I can use to describe this and again off the top it's a three four time signature um, there's like a da, 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 drum fill that starts the song into a four bar intro drums bass guitar I'm hearing acoustic guitar keyboards shakers tambourine and then there's this killer bass run that takes us into verse one and I gotta say the bass tone and the placement in the mix of this whole <laughs> song is just it's killer it's one of the best bass tones I've ever heard, and I think I'm also hearing some strings or keys here at the top, and if there's anything else, uh, fill me in. No, uh, that's, that, that's it. You've done a good job. <laughs> I must tell you, if there's one song that's going to stump me, it's this one because there's so much going on as we get in. I mean, it took me days to go through this, Roger. It's it's so <laughs> cool. But I'm going to uh, get into verse one, and I'm going to read all these lyrics and have you set them up for us because I want to know what you're talking about here. These are some great words. Well, let me let me forewarn you. I didn't write the lyric. That was my partner Andy. He wrote most of the lyrics. Okay. Well, he wrote. Okay. I mean, he wrote all the lyrics. I would occasionally chime in and he bounce ideas off me but he was the lyricist for sure being the lead singer perfect well hopefully you can uh, uh shed some light on what's going on here because they're they're great words curtain opens spotlights the gentleman signing his love letter best wishes simpleton dialogue swam from his pen like polywogs he knew better that perfume was gravity pulling him closer to what could be tragedy love is blind deaf and dumb but never mind now listen, if I could just write chicken scratch on a paper and sing it and it would make sense and it would be some kind of poetic art, I would do it. I don't think that's what's going on here. And if it is, this guy's a, even a bigger genius than I thought. But could you shed a little light about what's happening here with these words? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, you know, he's talking about how we, we, we lose all sense of reason and consciousness when the uh, tractor beam of love hypnotizes us into uh, uh, a significant other. And um, the song is called "New Mistake." It's, uh, <laughs> it's like your latest new mistake. Yeah, here, here I go again. I'm, I'm doing something that I probably know better. Uh, might come to bite me in the ass in the end, but I can't help myself because I'm attracted on so many levels. And uh, um, Andy held in very high esteem some of the great um, rock and pop poets of generations past, and uh, certainly is one of them himself and that did not come easily he worked at his lyric writing as much as anything else um and who knows what draft that is you know i mean i he would yeah. he, he was always he would share with me where he was headed and what the idea was and his intention but it might be weeks before he presented something to us to like okay i think you know i think i've got 90 percent of it let's start talking about what the harmony arrangements might look like and how we can how we can decorate the musical arrangement to support my lyric that was always very important to us you know we had heroes like elvis costello and and um uh, 10 cc and and uh you know uh, uh, harry nilsson and randy newman and and these people uh are always kind of reminding us and joni mitchell you know how far this stuff can be taken mm -hmm. and then it was like, oh, shit, the, the bar has already been raised way the hell up here in the last 20 years. And, again, what, what does it look like? What's our contribution to that going to look like? And it's a, it's a great journey, as you know, of being in a band where you're sure. wearing your heart on your sleeve and putting it all out there. It's a journey of self-discovery. You're like, well, what is it I really want to say that, that I have confidence in saying, that I uh, feel is worthy of sharing with the world, that I, that I even have a reason to share any of this, you know? And, and uh, right. that's, that's part of the behind-the-scenes joy of doing all this. Was Andy open to lyrical suggestion? When he brings something like this in, you thought maybe a word could be better, the imagery could be a little bit better. Was, was he open to that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's great. I, I, I dabbled in lyrics at the time, but in the 
years later, I would, I would just out of sheer necessity, have to uh, learn to write my own lyrics and write better and better lyrics because I was like, okay, if I'm going to sing something to support these melodies that I've created that I'm very happy about, it can't be half-assed. It's got to be. It's got to be decent, you know. Um, yeah. And thankfully, I had folks like him to kind of aspire to, you know. But we made a good team that way. I'd gone to music school and I'd studied a lot of arranging and was very excited to try arranging ideas and fascinating things I had in mind for the musical side of the group. And he he was always willing to explore that with me. And you know, even the background vocals was like he might have an idea for a counter melody. And if we agreed on that, then I'd skedaddle over here and you know, start arranging what the harmonies might look like and bring it back to him. What do you think of this? And so we, we, we made a good partnership that way. And, and um, definitely, uh, you know, we both had like uh, things we were stronger at in our tool belt and our respective tool belts that we would bring to the party. Um, you know, and then not to mention the, the great musicians we hooked up with uh, once we once we flushed out the song. You, you've seen the, the popular good looking lead singer take off from his band because he thinks, you know, he, he thinks he's the one. He's it. And sometimes a band is a sum of their parts. You said it. It's that balance. You know, his, his, he might have a couple extra tools in his belt that you don't have and vice versa. And that's what that's what makes a band. This first verse, I noticed that it sounds like there's double vocals where you say swam from his pen like polywogs and deaf and dumb. But never mind. Do you, do you recall if those were doubled? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I I love that, and it, it's it's subtle, but it's so cool. You can feel it more so than hear it even. I mean, obviously, as we were getting more familiar with. The studio process, demoing and experimenting, like you said, you know, technology was starting to happen faster and faster. We had sampling at our disposal. We could try a trumpet part, even though neither of us played trumpet. And yet, the, the things that you hear on this song or, or any, they're they're all being inspired by our favorite records. Prior to sampling, prior to computers, and prior to. Um, just recording technology, right? Even even the Beatles, they start with like four tracks, if I'm not mistaken. And by the time you get <laughs> and kept bouncing down, <laughs> yeah. And then by the but by the time you get to uh, Abbey Road, uh, Let It Be, if I'm not mistaken, they have 16. You know, mm-hmm. so y- we were learning our the possibilities too, and we had even more technology. So arranging became premier because we started to realize. You can overarrange a song. You can underarrange a song. You can you can use this whole sound palette that's available to you, from a violin to synthesizers and percussion, and stacked background vocals, and all the myriad of studio tricks that were that had been well fleshed out by the time we got in the studio in the late '80s. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, yeah. they'd done a, so much stuff that happened in the '70s because people. The sky was the limit. I mean, right? I mean, Dark Side of the Moon is like 74, if I'm not mistaken. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. and same with Queen and all the stuff they were going for and, and bands like Steely Dan and 10CC. And, and uh, so we were, <laughs> in many ways, we were just trying to catch up with all this great music that had come before us. And then like, okay, well, what, how far can we take it? Well, you, you, you took it pretty far, <laughs> but it doesn't sound like it's bloated. You Good. know, it doesn't sound like it's it's uh, there's too much. Hey, they're just throwing stuff in to be artsy. It doesn't sound like that. And I'm glad you brought up the arrangement because I haven't even talked about that. The arrangement of this song is, to me, it's perfect. I just I I love how where Thank the you. parts go. I love that there's two musical interludes, bridges, whatever you want to call them in this song that happen, and and there's room in the song for it. It doesn't feel forced. It's it's great. I want to talk about chorus one now. better catch me when i fall i'm on my roller skates 
Cause any old way that I fall, I land in your arms even though it's wrong. Cause I love my new mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> B- blinded by love. Well, exactly. Exactly right. I also love that all three choruses in this song do not repeat the same lyrics. And that's risky sometimes in pop music. You know, you want to have that hook to hit you over the head. And again, uh, this song would not be the same if it was chorus one uh, repeated three times. I I love that it changes up. Uh, The whole feel here in the chorus changes. I'm not talking about the time signature, but the feel. Most of verse one, the instruments drop out to just drums, bass, and is that a Rhodes keyboard in there that I'm hearing? Uh, it's more. It's a Wurlitzer. It's a Wurlitzer. Okay, there's a Wurlitzer. Uh, the guitar is playing an overdriven counter melody lick. It's killer. It's kind of panned off left, and on the lines, I land in your arms even though it's wrong because I love my new mistake. The last two lines. Am I hearing a harpsichord in there as well? Or is that the Wurlitzer? I'd have to go back and listen. Uh, I might be a harpsichord. I know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember it. Yeah, it's something arpeggiating. Uh, it might even be the guitar. You don't remember? We're just going back 32 years, Roger. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what I had for lunch this afternoon. You're doing a great job. Um, on those last two lines, the guitars come back in. One's playing chords and the other's playing uh, an arpeggiated guitar part that's panned off right. I love those last two lines, what happens there in the chorus. It's all one feel for the first three lines, not four lines. It's not two, four. It's like three lines in the last two. It's, 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 it's strange and it kind of, I don't know, it does something to me. Growing up in uh, being heavily inspired by Jazz world, and again, just uh, a lot of uh, great pop rock recordings from the 25 years prior. Tension and release is important, right? I, I, I lo- I've always loved the pop song format because you've basically got three and a half, three to four minutes to say what you need to say. So you better figure out how to say it, lure the listener in, have them tapping their steering wheel and singing along, and then like get out. But you're taking them on a little journey. I, that's, that's what I always loved about a lot of the great progressive rock bands is that you put the needle down and 15 minutes later you're like, my God, where have I been? And I haven't, <laughs> you know, there's no substances in my system. And somehow the music was able to transport me to complete, you know, whether it's a Rush record or, or gosh, I don't know. Um, um, there were so many. Yeah, yeah, yes, Tales of Topographic Ocean exactly. or whatever, something like that. Yeah. Exactly. So those people, and again, we're talking about bands that had. Same instruments as all of us. Guitar, bass, drums, keys. That's all they had. And they and they were creating these crazy sci-fi hobbit worlds, you know. And that always fascinated me. Uh, Todd Rundgren did a really great job of that. And I was like, well, what does that look like for our songs? And so this is a good example of that. Um, because uh, that chorus, like you said, there's a big scene change. New hooks introduced. And we're now taking a departure from that feel, attitude, headspace of verse one. But then it gets wrapped up in the section that you just said. So it's kind of like, yes, oh, okay, no, we haven't deviated entirely. We're bringing it back home. And that's where the, the melody kind of, it, you, you know, you're saying these phrases and you're, it's your departure, but now you're coming back in for your home landing. Yeah. I love my new mistake, regardless of the uh, tension, confusion, uh, that the previous parts of the song have referenced, and um, so you know, it's always it's always a jigsaw puzzle. W- one of my favorite and probably most inspirational songwriters, craftsmen of what exactly we're talking about, is Andy Partridge and, and Colin from XTC. Yes, awesome. And he always described the songwriting process for him. He he's actually a gamer. But, of course, not in a video game sense, because video games weren't around in the 60s and 70s when he was a kid and young adult. He loved making up games uh, in all of the different board games that existed at the time when we were kids. And one of the things, one of his hobbies was to, con- to make up a concept for a game. All right, well, if this is what the, the players do at the finish line, what does it look like leading up to the finish line? And what, what are all the traps that they can get into and that they have to solve their way out of, and all the riddles and everything, right? And he said he always applied that to his songwriting. Here's your starting place. We're going to go down this pathway and have all these adventures along the way. 
And once in a while, we'd go, oh, but, but don't forget about home, right? And home would always be like the chorus. There's that familiarity. But now we're going to yeah. go. And he said his favorite part was to explore what a bridge might look like. Because on the bridge, you got to take the listener all the way over here to a place that they were never expecting in a million years. And then the challenge was going to be, how do I creatively and smoothly and cleverly bring the listener back home to the final shout chorus out? Or, or whatever, yeah. you know. And then you, as many ways as you can think of to do that. And that, he said that's why, that's why songwriting to him never got old. Because he was always making up a new board game every time he, he did that. <laughs> yeah, it's a great analogy. Yeah, and so that, I really related to that. And so, yeah. uh, well, this is a good song. This song started because Andy had the A section. He played that for me, and I was immediately sucked in. I'm like, oh, my God. We, we, you know, this is so catchy. I already love where this is head, head of the feel, like you said. Yes. And so I was immediately inspired. All right, all right. Andy's just given me what the kind of starting point of the board game is. What, how can I help us create a whole world out of this? You know, so that was my self-imposed loving duty uh, that I was, I yeah. was going to try to contribute to. And so we both set out on that journey of construction and, and the, the, the master riddle, all within the confines <laughs> of a pop song, not getting too heady, not getting too hyper-intellectual. Sure. We still want people to sing along and just feel the gentleness and the sway of this tune, like you said. And um, that, that is the joy of that whole world. I mean, that's, that's why you know, we committed our lives to doing that. Hey everybody, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to hear Roger Joseph Manning Jr. talk about one of my favorite songs of all time after a few words from our sponsors. Hey Chris, as far back as I can remember... I've been wearing band t-shirts. I have a question for you. Do you remember what your first ever band t-shirt was? I do. You, what was it? It was Motley Crue. <laughs> wow. Okay. Elementary school, middle school, what? Would have been elementary school, and it was their mascot, the Alistair Fiend mascot. Wow. Elementary school, wearing a Motley Crue shirt. I think my first ever, I can't remember exactly, it was either a Nine Inch Nails broken t-shirt or... A Green Day Dookie t-shirt. It's one of those two, and I can't remember which one. But, you know, my point here being that the band t-shirt has never gone out of style. To this day, you're wearing a band t-shirt right now. I'm wearing a band t-shirt right now as we're doing this. And, uh, you know, I don't think it'll ever go out of style. I don't either. I, I, why would it? It's comfortable. It gets the point across. Why, why else would you question it? I think band t-shirts will always be cool, which leads me to talking about our new sponsor, Rockabilia.com. Rockabilia.com has over 500,000 items. They have more band merch, not just t-shirts. We're talking hoodies and everything else you can imagine than any other company or website, and everything is officially licensed. That's right. It features bands across a wide range of genres. Rockabilia is where it's at. Yeah, and if you're a Krista Makes a Podcast listener, you can use the discount code at checkout, DEMAKES, to get 15% off your order. That's a pretty good deal, especially if you have to get gifts for somebody or if you just want to hook yourself up with a nice new t-shirt. Man, I was on there. I was looking at so much stuff I wanted on Rockabilia today. So you better believe I'm going to be using that DEMAKES discount code myself. That's what I was going to ask you. Do we get 50% off because it's our show sponsoring? Are they sponsoring our show? Yeah, yeah, just go put the makes in there. You get 15% off. Go buy a Less Than Jake t-shirt on there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might get a new Motley Crue t-shirt. Nice. Hey, this is Dewey Halpas, host of Peer Pleasure on the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Join me each week as I explore another long-form conversation with one of your favorite musicians, actors, comedians, or creatives. From Chino Moreno of the Deftones, John Gorley of Portugal, the man, to Fat Mike from No Effects, and Ian Mackay from Fugazi and Minor Threat, we go all over the map. From Fallout Boy to Slayer, Peer Pleasure has it all. Check us out now on Sound Talent Media. And now, back to the show. 
A couple other things about Chorus 1. At the top, right before the chorus starts, there's some castanets. Uh, and they're also on the line, Cuz Annual Away, right at Cuz, right there, the castanets come back. <laughs> Uh, first line and the third line here, there's double vocals. There's also a cool woo-woo-woo backing vocal that happens after I'm on my roller skates. Just happens that one time, a little ear candy there. I love chorus one. You don't even mess around. You're straight into verse two. Intermission gave way to a miracle. The birth of an accident grew to a spectacle that couldn't wait. The mother was three weeks late. So Father Mason, clutching his crucifix, baptized the baby in whiskey and licorice. What a lovely way. Drowning sins in tooth decay. (laughs) There's a lot there. Yeah, there's piles there. And the best part about (laughs) lyrics like these is that different listeners can have different interpretations, different what does this mean to them. One of the things I always loved about Andy's lyric writing that I certainly have tried to continue in mine is really having fun with uh, words that are fun to say and have an incredible enunciation and animation to them, like crucifix and licorice and uh, dynamite and lyric words like that. And so much of the kind of Judeo-Christian culture permeates the last 2,000 years of history and art and literature, whether or not you're raised in a religious household. And there's that blessing of the wine as the blood of Christ and blah, blah, blah. And so you have those things start kind of poking into this baptism and the, the, the birth of the unexpected, potentially unwanted child and uh, the, the unexpected parents. I love the whiskey and licorice because then the, your, the last lines, you're drowning sins, the whiskey, and then the tooth decay. Yeah, that's all, <laughs> that's all straight up. You know, for me, it's all Catholic imagery um, yeah. with the original sin and, and et, cetera, et cetera. So, again, if there's a fun, clever, catchy way of weaving that into your three and a half minute pop song, more, more power to you. And, and you know, yeah. and these are these are philosophies and that we adhered to that we had in common. Obviously, Andy and I were different people, different things that inspired us. He liked some groups that I didn't care for, and vice versa. But at the end of the day, there's plenty of overlap to make these constructions and be on the same page. In other words, we're bring, we're bringing ideas to each other, and rarely were they too like, oh, that's too far out. I don't get what you're trying to do. I mean. We understood what each other was trying to do for the most part, and that's why we're, we were able to uh, pile on each other's ideas you know, to a final product. Well, verse two, there's strings and keys throughout here, as are shakers and tambourine. I love the little surprises in this song. On the line, intermission gave way to a miracle. Right afterwards, panned off left. It almost sounds like French horns or trumpets that happen there. Is that what you were talking about? Were those actually keys? They were for the demo, but yeah, we brought in real players for the entirety of these records. It's okay, because I was going to say, for, for 1993 uh, or whenever you recorded this, it, it, I didn't think they had uh, sounds that could emulate that. It, sound, it sounded real, so they, they, they are indeed real horns there. On the line, the mother was three weeks late and drowning sins in tooth decay. You get a couple of double-tracked vocals there. Uh, on the second line, the birth of an accident grew to a spectacle. There's like a string crescendo into like a piano flutter that happens off to the right. I don't even know what you would call what I'm hearing there, but I I tried best to describe that. There's a harp sweep. Ah, that's what it is then. Okay. It's the harp sweep there. You know, so you're reminding me about this verse. We were pretty close to finishing the demo, and Andy was particularly concerned, and he brought it to my attention. He said, verse 2, nothing's happening musically. It's, It's the same... We already did that in verse one. It's the only part of the song that's just kind of sitting there flat. And it didn't dawn on me at all until he said that. 
And and I realized I was like, oh, he's right. And well, shit, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> I didn't have any ideas, and so we just started throwing concepts at it. And it it thankfully he had finished the lyric and recorded it. It might have even just been a scratch vocal at the time, but we we started playing with the holes in the lyric. Like so, like you said, the lyric says something. There's a musical response. The lyric says something. It's a mu- then a musical response. Yeah. I, I remember there being all kinds of trial and error. Of course, this is what we arrived at um, to solve that puzzle. But I, I remember, you know, I remember that being a moment of like, oh shit, verse two sucks because we it's you know <laughs> yeah it's, it's the it's, it's the boring samey. part of the song. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on the line here, the mother was three weeks late. The third line. On that line, you get these like what I'm calling tubular bells, like church bells that happen. Correct. They're kind of panned off, panned off to the right, and yeah. it only happens that one time. And I love that. I love. I call it restraint because when <laughs> I hear something that cool in a song, if I ever come up with something, I'm like, "That's really cool. I want to do it four or five times," you know. And sometimes the best thing is not to do it again, and that's what you did here. It's awesome. Restraint is. Uh... A lesson everybody must learn. I'm still learning that lesson. It's um, uh, the temptation to have fun and and to sometimes overdo things is always lurking. Yeah, I don't subscribe to less is more. I have a hard time with that. And <laughs> I always, oh, it makes me feel good. I want more. I want more. You know. But I I love that. Again, I wrote in the notes here, Roger. The bass tone's just sick. It's so good, and it's at a level in the mix where. I don't know, other songs, other genres, other recordings, it would probably be too loud, but it's just, it, it, it works perfect here. The last line, I think this is what you were uh, thinking I was talking about with that, uh, that harp earlier. There's like these, I, I call them suspenseful dramatic strings that take us into chorus two. It really lifts that part there at the end of, end of this verse. Cool. Thank, thank you for noticing. I, lo- I love when other artists appreciate all the effort you know that goes into these things. Especially um, back then, you guys you guys weren't flying stuff around in the computer, man. This was all all to tape, and and that's that's testament to insanely hard work. And uh, you were under the microscope here. I know you were. Oh oh yeah, and we were we were our own worst critics for sure. And and um, we had a standard, and we were going to kill ourselves trying to meet that bar that we had raised for ourselves. We were very blessed with our production team in Albie Galutin and Jack Joseph Wig, who was uh, in charge of the engineering side of it. You know, so the bass sounds and all the sounds you hear went through a whole other level of their ears and microscopic attention to detail. And so we had a very great uh, team of uh, perfectionists (laughs) on this. Well, th- thanks for bringing that up. I-, I don't talk about that often or if ever on this show that, you know, we always talk about sounds or what's this, what's that, but you don't realize, the listeners don't realize what goes on to get those sounds sometimes. There's times you'll take three, four, five, six hours to get just a bass sound dialed up. Yep. And then the next day you come in and no one's happy with it and you're going to do it again. Yep. Obviously, we we had read some articles like that, but we didn't know the extent of that until you get there and you're doing it yourself. And the yeah. clock is ticking. Everybody's telling you how much money you're spending, and uh, you know yeah. you're just going to have to live on the road forever until you pay it all back. And you, just, and you don't, <laughs> you know, you're, you're not trying to be decadent. You're not trying to uh, crawl up your own ass with any of these ideas. All you know is it's not right yet, and we've got to keep throwing shit at it until we go. That's it. That's the magic formula right there. Um, yeah, and sometimes, sure. yeah, sometimes that can happen in 20 minutes and sometimes it can happen in two or three days. Yeah. Well, we get into chorus two here. three choruses are different i love that the lyric is looks like our heroes gonna fall the bow's about to break because any old way that i fall i'll be in your arms as we lie awake with our lovely new mistake 
So instead of my new mistake in the first quarter, it's R. You're, you're, you're both taking ownership of it. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> it's not all on me. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I found that interesting, that little turnaround there. Uh, it sounds like, Roger, that the Worlds are here is doing a slightly different pattern. Uh, than chorus one, it's kind of panned off to the right. There's some other. I, I a b these like ten times, and I just <laughs> my my brain started to melt. But it it does sound different from chorus one. And again, you're not flying stuff around on Pro Tools and printing it, uh, you know, in, in other sections of the song. So it it makes sense that there was maybe some ad libbing going on there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, expanding upon an idea again, trying to just keep you're just dangling this carrot the whole way, hope, hoping the listener is following along and. You, you're just trying to add dimension. As a musician, I, I, I bore and tire very quickly and very easily, and I'm, I'm spoiled. I grew up listening to players who were always taking it in all kinds of different places and, and um, adding these nuanced, subtle moments that, that breathe new life into it in any given moment. And, uh, well, as you know, right, you, you take a new song out on the road, you guys are playing it every night. Somewhere around, like, the 30th show, you're like, Oh shit! I tried something tonight that I've never done before. It might have even been an accident, and yeah. and the, and your bandmate goes, "What was that you played in the last chorus? It was fucking killer, dude! How come you didn't do that on the original?" <laughs> well, beca- yeah. you know, because you hadn't exhausted, and and the song had not had a chance to stand the test of time, simmer, uh, new life got breathed into it. Um, right? Sometimes if you get into this hypnosis with a song that you're playing every night starts opening up other parts of your brain and your heart and stuff just starts coming to the surface and there's some of these songs that were uh had been around longer than others and you know by the time we were recording them started taking liberties uh with some of the parts you know conversely a song like um joining a fan club Mm -hmm. that was one that we finished very close and we were finishing in the studio even though we'd started it and I'll never forget, we were touring that song, playing it live, and we worked out this arrangement that all of us preferred. We we're like, oh, we should have recorded it in the studio this way. <laughs> but there was no, you know, there was no way to have known that unless we had toured the song first, which a lot of bands back in the day, they would do that, right? Before mm-hmm. Zeppelin would record Zeppelin two, they were already playing all those songs live. Of course. You know, yeah. and you and you that's where some of those incredible feels come from when you hear the recordings. We didn't really have that luxury because our songs were so intricate for a four piece. You couldn't just go jam them out live when you're mm-hmm. when you're opening for the Black Crows. It's like yeah. you had to have your shit dialed and, and the arrangement had to be very specific because you were trying to maximize the fact that there were only four of you on stage. Mm-hmm. So every everything had to be in its place. And so we didn't have that luxury often. And uh, anyway. Yeah, well, chorus two here, uh, you get the double vocals again on uh, the third line there, and you get that woo oo oo backing vocal on uh, after the second line, the bow's about to break, and at the very end here, with our lovely new mistake, that last lyric in the chorus two, you get a two-bar modulation into what I'm calling a musical interlude. Uh, it's basically the verse up a key. It's awesome. It's 16 bars. I'm hearing are those xylophones that are coming in there. That's a tack piano. A tack piano. No kidding. Dun, dun, okay. Dun, 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 yeah, I thought they were xylophones. Okay, tack piano comes in there. There's some vocal ooze here, and the guitar lead goes to a dual harmony lick at points, uh, pretty much at the at the middle and at the very end before we lead into chorus three. You better catch me when I fall. 
my sugar trampoline. Because any old way that I fall, I land in your arms even though it's wrong. Because I love my new mistake. Again, he's going back now to my new mistake, taking ownership of it. You know, just summarizing, ra- wrapping it up. And, and uh, it's almost like, yeah, no matter how often I trip and fall, love catches us. Love's got us. Love has this relationship. And ultimately, the love for my unexpected new child is holding it all together, you know, because mama bear and papa bear are like, we got to make this, we got to make this work. And, and our love will figure out how to make it work, even though what brought us together might, we might not have been the most conscious and huh. smart about things. That's really cool. Well, at this point in the song, there's so much that's happened but we're only at two minutes and 30 seconds of a four minute song. (laughs) The last minute and a half is what I'm calling a bridge here before you go into the outro. And the whole outro is one minute long, but it's just, it's, it's epic at the end. It's just like the, the, the best ending ever, but the bridge here, uh, it's this big drum and band buildup on the first two lines. The ending's so tragic when many years later, the baby had grown up the And then on the very last line, there's a very breathy, like blown out vocal that's about two decibels louder than anything else there uh, when you say her first mistake. Uh, it, it, it's really cool. I don't know if that was almost sounds like it was done into like maybe a bullhorn or, or some kind of d- distortion effect there. I don't remember how it was achieved. I mean, it might have been it might have been, like you said, sung very breathy and soft. And then you you amplify the hell out of it and you smack the compressors and yeah maybe distort the a little bit and well, the, and, yeah would you call this a bridge part uh the bridge to me was always the solo the solo okay okay what would this part be then <laughs> uh this part would be <laughs> the second bridge <laughs> well there's the whole outro like you said which yeah. is just a repetitive new phrase uh or re-emphasizing the new mistake hook but yeah. there's the build up to that which follows in the it's the it's the architecture and framework of the of a regular chorus but we start mm-hmm. reharmonizing it so you're t- yeah. you know it's variations on a theme you, you still have the same uh verse melody but you're re- reharmonizing it with the um fakery of oh you think you're going to go to a final chorus but you go to this outro hook instead. Which I want I want to ask did uh, either producer and am I am I pronouncing this right uh, I'll be gluten Albie. Uh, Albie Galutin and uh, Jack Joseph Puig. Did either one of them in the process, or did you say, hey, maybe we should go back to the chorus here, or, or was that a no-no you I'm always pretty wanted sure, to have a, a... I'm pretty sure Andy and I hammered these things out in the demo process when we were writing the song together. It sounded like it from, from what I heard in the demo. So Yeah, yeah. And, and again, it's just about studying all your favorite records, and like yourself, you're, me- you're mentioning things now that fascinate you about what we did here. And there were endless things that fascinated us about what our heroes were up to. Oh, yeah. And you you take, especially when they make an impression, for me, I just take all those and put them up in a filing cabinet in my head. And then when you're, when you're, when you're arranging your own song, he's basically going, shit, I'm stuck. What do I do here? Well, let me go through the filing cabinet. <laughs> and you just start throwing <laughs> ideas at it. And um, like you said a, a little while ago, most, most of the ideas you throw at it aren't going to work. Yeah. It uh, actually ends up not panning out at all. And then you keep doing it, and um, uh, so you're piling ideas on top of each other. And but but that's also the fun because you're exploring with this within this environment, this genre. Uh, again, of a lot of uh, great inspiration and poets and architects that have come before you, and it's almost like you know their ghosts are going, "Come on, you can do it, you can do it," but I'm not going to tell you how. <laughs> or you're, you're just you're just gonna have to listen to my art and you have to study my art a little bit more and a little deeper and then there's that magic place that happens for everybody if they do this enough which is it's one thing to just copy your heroes but who wants to do that i mean that's not that's not what we're in the business of we we there's no reason you can't be inspired by it but you've got to you've got to make your own statement, and it's got to be an extension of your own personality, or a combination of personalities. In this case, 
jellyfish's personalities. That is the ultimate final puzzle piece, if you will. Because the listeners can tell when when you're like cheating and you're just like stealing something. And, and <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we had no interest in stealing. We, we were as excited about great moments in rock pop as anybody else. But it was like, we're not going to fool anybody if you just grab this and plop it into you. You know, so you're constantly massaging and, and, and uh, you know, oh, well, oh, that's very George Harrison, what, what that would have been. Well, yes and no, because it's starting to, now we're getting into like, it may, it may be George Harrison because you've got um, that, you know, slide melody, double track slide mm-hmm. melody that he was so known for and he decorated his music with. But we're sitting there playing these these great, you know, Lyle Workman played the solo on that song. And he's a, oh, okay. he's a masterful guitar player in, in all styles. And he was a Bay Area musician who we were very much a fan of. We, we still are. I, I love him and work with him all the time still. And we told him what we wanted to do. And we said, look, this is, this is going to basically be as intricate as Andy's vocal melody, but you got to figure out a way to play it with the, with the slide on the guitar. And so, you know, huh. it, it took a while. And the three of us, we were singing little melody ideas to each other. And, uh, you know, I, I'm imitating like, <laughs> and everybody's laughing thought, at me. But yeah. but he goes, oh, I know what you're talking about. You know, yeah. let me let me try that. Sometimes we have to get animalistic and guttural yeah. to get our point across in the studio. Yeah, I drive I drive my drummer crazy. I'm like, no, it's da 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 He's like, come on, dude. You know. <laughs> come on, dude. <laughs> Yeah, like you know, it's it's frustrating when you you're not a drummer, but you can hear it in your head like Absolutely. me. I, I'll I go insane sometimes. Well, let's talk about this uh, this this lyric here of uh, I don't know what we're gonna call this. It's not a bridge, but uh, right before we get to the outro, the ending turned tragic when many years later the baby had grown up and married a pop singer. I guess it was her turn to make her first mistake. <laughs> Nice little turnaround there. And again, got that breathy, blown out vocal there on her first mistake. It's just one of those things in the song doesn't happen again. It just happens that one time. It just gives the song that extra bit uh, as if it needed any more character. The end here. I got to level with you, Roger. I I pride myself on going through point by point in the song. I'd have to spend another hour on just the outro here, if I were to go every point, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do the Cliff's notes on this because it's insane here. The last minute of the song. The lyric is, any old time at all, any old way that I fall. And that happens six times. On the seventh time, you start getting into some backing vocals where I I couldn't find these lyrics online. I'm hearing can't stop falling, gotta fly away maybe. And I don't know if you say no need to stay. Is that what's happening there? Uh, Help me, darling, can't stop falling. Okay, okay. That's going on while... All this is happening. Uh, and, and by the way, after that, whatever we're going to call it, the, the bridge there, there is a musical interlude of eight bars that happens before the vocals kick in uh, that I was just talking about. There's castanets that come back. I'm hearing wind chimes, maybe a triangle, bongos, synth stabs, hand claps. There's tubular bells all over. The drums, bass, and key groove are still there. The, a lot of the major guitars aren't there, though. All 
all the rest of this stuff is you're getting those backing vocals at the very end, which I'm kind of calling a call and response. And then uh, the, the song just fades out from there. It's, it's to- a total kitchen sink moment that works here. And again, with an exclamation point, I wrote bass real big because <laughs> the bass here is just it's so good on the whole song, but especially at the end here. Uh, th- thank you again for uh, you know your attention to detail. We, uh, you know, yeah, the, the song basically turns into an R and B track for the outro. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> it's it's funny you say that. I hear, oh my gosh, I, I don't know what I would how I would try to describe your band to somebody. I wrote a couple things. I wrote Beatles, Queen, Stevie Wonder, Hall and Oates, and Billy Joel. I just I hear That'll all work. of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plus about a, a, a hundred other things, but uh, that was that was just on <laughs> off the top of my head. I mean, all, all all of that makes its way into inspiring us, and and who knows how it all gets assembled after it's picked up off the cutting room floor from from all those things. But yeah, I mean, and again, that therein lies the fun. I mean, it's just it's just fun with music, and and again, we could be doing any kind of genre. We certainly enjoyed all kinds of genres, but. It made sense to, sense to us to have fun with pop rock world uh, and and do this and and um, uh, I'm just glad that you know eternally grateful that Phil Corderero and the guys at Charisma Virgin uh, and our and our manager and uh, the publishing companies and Albie and Jack all all believed in giving us a chance because mm-hmm. look we started and the first album comes out at the height of hair metal. <laughs> Yeah. Sunset Strip was ruling MTV. And then, you know, we all knew that Seattle was bubbling up and there's some great records were coming out, but they wasn't getting past like the underground kind of college scene. Yeah. Right? I mean, Soundgarden's what second album is on SST Records. I mean, it was just like all that sure. stuff was just, it's just going to stay in punk rock world. Well, great. Me and my friends are going to the shows, but Middle America was never going to hear about it. And then much to our all of our amazement, you know, as what Thurston Moore said, the year punk broke, even though punk had been around for 15 years, was 1991 with Nevermind. Yeah. Because that was, and I'll never forget, I was doing some late night shopping in a grocery store uh, in, in, I was living in San Rafael with my brother Chris at the time. I had to go get groceries. And I'm there in the parking lot. It's late night, so there's no cars in the parking lot except this one car way over here. Bunch of high school kids hanging out. Smoking, drinking, doing whatever, what, whatever mischief they're they're up to. Yeah, and I'm just walking into the store. And I'm looking over at them, and they're blasting music, and I go, "Oh shit, they're not listening to Cinderella or Guns N' Roses or Motley Crue. They're listening to Nirvana." Sure. How the hell? I didn't see that coming. Mm-hmm. And so our second album comes out at the height of grunge. So we were never commercially relevant as far as what was trending at the time. That had always been my life, speaking for myself. I always seemed to be over here while the crowd was going over here. And, you know, half the time that wasn't deliberate. It's like, oh, I, I want to belong. I want to get along uh-huh. with the cool kids. Well, but I, my interests are over here or whatever. So we were just being true to ourselves and what was inspiring us and exciting us. And we we, we said, look, we believe we're writing very catchy sing-along material there's got to be other people out there certainly in america let alone the world that can relate to that that was that was the colossal experiment that was what we were gambling and betting on in spite of what we saw on popular radio which like i said was either janet jackson dance or whatever great more power you know because right because even hip-hop wasn't commercial yet it was starting to bubble up or it was what was left of a you know a new generation of classic rock uh, in the form of, of grunge and, and stuff. Great. I, I love that Black Sabbath can be introduced to a new audience, you know? Well, I got to tell you, I, I in researching for this episode, I read all the comments. You know, I was watching live videos of this song, the demo, the actual track, the lyric videos. I went through them all. And it's it's a resounding, it, it's over and over and over the comments are, you know, besides this band never got their just due, blah, blah, blah. There are more people discovering your band now, and I think it's going to continue for years to come. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say you were ahead of your time. You were your time. You were just marching to your own beat, the beat of your own drum, 
doing your thing. That's the Catch-22 musicians. If you make the same album twice, oh, they stayed the same. If you change, oh, they changed, you know? <laughs> At the end of the day, all, all, you, can, all you can do is, is be, be true to yourself. And um, I don't get into the politics of bands, and I, I never ask these questions. It's none of my business, but... In my opinion, if the band were to, to, to book a show tomorrow, you guys would play to more people now than you did back in the day. I truly believe that. That may be. I, I, do, I do continue to get some very nice compliments uh, from people about once every couple months, if not once a month. And uh, I had the pleasure last night on this note, you'll appreciate this, Justin Hawkins from the band The Darkness. Of course, yeah. He has his, his YouTube show. He uh, I think maybe it's once a week, once every two weeks. A friend of mine said, oh, you got to tune in his show. You'll enjoy it. He's got a lot of the same sense of humor and kind of attitude as you do about music. I said, great, I'll tune in. The second time I tuned in, he was doing a whole Jellyfish review. Oh, that! what did that feel like, man? That's got to be awesome. It, well, it blew my mind. It felt amazing. And last night, uh, backstage, there were so many people there. I didn't even know who half the people were going to be that night on the show. He's wandering around backstage, and my friend says, yeah, he's performing... A lot of the Queen songs tonight. He's singing some of the more, um, you know, kind of classic rock covers that, that people are doing. And I said, I just want to, there's so many people I want to talk to, but I really want to thank him for doing that jellyfish thing because he's often part of the appeal of his show is he kind of takes the piss out of a lot of bands on his show. <laughs> yeah. So, I follow, I follow Justin. Yeah. I know, I know his deal. <laughs> so, and more power to him. I, that's, yeah. So I was like, oh man, you know, he could have, who knows? He could have said anything about jellyfish, but he like yeah was very flattering. Anyway, I went up and told him before the evening swept him away, and it was great. We got to have a little five minute complimentary nostalgia session, and it was it was important and felt good. That is awesome. Well, well, listen, Roger, I I can't thank you enough for sitting in with us today. It was an absolute pleasure to not just talk to you, but to talk about this song. Uh, your band's one of a kind. Nobody sounds like Jellyfish. You, you guys are, are, are so original. Uh, anything you'd like to leave the listeners with before we break? I understand you released a record recently, May of, uh, of this year, uh, the Licorice Quartet. Tell us about that. Right. So that is a side project that was started back in 2017, whenever the three of us had any time. And it's uh, Eric and Eric Dover and Tim Smith from the second version of Jellyfish. They were in the touring band. Uh, Tim And Tim played on Spilt Milk as well. And um, we'd worked with each other off and on here and there, but few and far between. And then, you know, and then 20 years flew by. And I was like, man, this is crazy. I, w I would love to write with these guys again. And Eric and I were in the post-Jellyfish band, Imperial Drag, together. Um, but the three of us had never written together and recorded so that became a project. And then <laughs> we recorded 12 songs with uh, drummer Jeremy Stacy playing drums. It was a fantastic addition to that quartet. And um, our very f we, we knew we wanted to release them in chunks, so three EPs of four songs. And the very first EP, by sheer coincidence, this happened to a lot of folks, came out the very first week of COVID lockdowns. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but we got a great response from people who were like, Oh, I'm so sad, and your music has been so uplifting, and and uh, that's what it's all about. So over the over the course of the last two and a half years, we've done all three EPs, completed them, and like you said, the most recent one came out in May, and um, I can't recommend them enough to Jellyfish fans because, again, we weren't trying to like let's write a bunch of Jellyfish type songs. It's an extension of who we are as people and as as craftsmen, yeah. and it just came out, and. It doesn't sound exactly like Jellyfish. Obviously, Andy's not singing. His presence isn't there. But you still hear that very rich harmonic content, attention to detail. Uh, Eric Dover writes a lot of the lyrics. Uh, him and Tim Smith and, and myself, we all contrib we all trade off lead vocals and sometimes singing together, sometimes apart. I just think if people appreciate what Jellyfish laid down, you'll this is more territory like that for you to have fun with. So. Awesome, man. Well, hey, again, thank you so much, and, and, and have a great day. Licorice is spelled L-I-C-K-E-R. Yes, yes, -H. licorice. Yes, and uh, <laughs> I yeah, like it. <laughs> go there and have fun. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me on to talk about this. Um, it 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 never gets old to tap into memory lane and 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 uh, share share with people like yourself who ap appreciate all the hard work and, and effort that went into these things. Some may 
Hey everybody, I hope you all enjoyed that episode with Roger. The song you just heard is Fortunately by the Licorice Quartet from their newest EP called Threesome Volume 3. If you're a jellyfish enthusiast like me, you're absolutely going to enjoy the Licorice Quartet. And like Roger said, it's spelled L-I-C-K-E-R-I-S-H Quartet. Make sure you check them out. But don't go anywhere. We got lots more Chris to Makes a Podcast after a few words from our sponsors. What's up, everyone? This is Jay Reason, and I want to let you all know that Diablo Zen Podcast is now part of the Sound Talent Media family. Listen in as me and the one and only Danny Diablo, a.k.a. Lord Ezak, interview artists from the hardcore punk, metal, hip-hop scenes, and beyond. We have conversations with guests like actor Peter Green, DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill, L.A. street photographer Estevan Oriol, Jimmy G from New York City's legendary Murphy's Law, and pro wrestler Vampiro, to name a few. If you're a fan of good discussions, lots of laughs, tune in and join the fun. Hey, everybody. If you like Chris to makes a podcast, I'm going to assume that you like music podcasts. And if you like music podcasts, check out One Hit Thunder. Each week, we dive into a one hit wonder. And along the way, we gain some knowledge and have some laughs. Lou Bega, Crazy Town, Harvey Danger, The New Radicals, AHA. We're over 100 episodes in now. And to paraphrase the great Matthew Wilder, nothing's going to break our stride. Subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Chris to Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is email your best song via MP3 only and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's featured band is the Doozers, an indie rock band from the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. The band took their name from the little green construction workers on the 80s TV show, Fraggle Rock. Pretty cool. The band consists of Sean Donnelly on guitar and vocals, Melanie Kelly on bass and vocals, Parker Grissom on guitar, and Kyle Garland on the drums. Here's a snippet of their song, Cytoplasm. Lay it all out, lay it all out, needed something I can fathom. All these parts With Chris and Chris. So, Chris, you and I both got off of this conversation with Roger saying to each other, that was one of the best episodes. And that is no exaggeration. That was awesome. What a song. <laughs> Just, yeah. I mean, uh, there's everything in this. You know, I think that, uh, that Roger, uh, what's the word I want to want to use here? He, uh, I don't know. I don't think it gives him or his band enough credit. He kind of says, you know, we we tried this and tried that. We didn't want to copy anybody. And it's like, dude, nobody sounds like you guys. I mean, I can hear all these influences, but you can't you can't pinpoint one thing. No, they take influence from all the best influences, in my opinion. And Chris, you heard me. The first thing I came on and said to him before I gave him the spiel about how the episode's going to go, I said to him, Roger, first off, I want to tell you that this song that you're going to talk about today it's one of my favorite songs of all time. Definitely in my top 20. Yes, I have figured out my top 100 songs many times throughout my life. New Mistake is always up there. And Chris, what else is funny is in our Facebook group, when I first booked Roger to come on, I wrote that I'm so excited. I just booked an artist to talk about a song that has my favorite outro ever in any song. And everyone, there's all these comments of people guessing what song I'm talking about. And one person, Michael Valeri Jr. called it. (laughs) And I was very impressed. I have talked about how much I love that outro on like other podcasts on One Hit Thunder and stuff. We actually did a Jellyfish episode of One Hit Thunder about the song Baby's Coming Back, which... You know, we could have done that song, but (laughs) this was one where I kind of just went, no, we got to do New Mistake. It's one of my all-time favorite, one of my personal all-time favorite songs. I 
I had to insist that we do this song. Yeah, and you know, every band has their uh, skeletons in the closet, things that happened. Uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what happened with this band, and, and I, I tiptoed around it at the end, but Roger was really gracious when I said, and I, I think he knows too, I said, y- your band's legend is bigger now than it's ever been. You know, if, if they were to get back together, I think they'd be really surprised. I think their music is going to influence generations to come. Um, it's just, it, it, it is it's such a cliche word. It's timeless. You know, these guys weren't before their time, ahead of their time. They were right where they needed to be. I said that to him. When we did that episode of One Hit Thunder, our guest was Scott Klopfenstein. Mm -hmm. And we just geeked out on Jellyfish for like an hour straight. You know, he's a huge fan. There's people everywhere that are such a huge fan of this band. Like you said, Chris, their legend continues to grow. I thought Roger was so eloquent in talking about the art of songwriting. I could have listened to him talk for another hour, which is kind of the uh, same sentiment that you expressed to me when you got off. Oh, yeah, no, and I've I've learned so much. I know listeners have heard me say this. I've learned so much from this show. Uh, one of the things I learned is something that Roger talked about today in verse two. They're listening back and they're saying, hmm, Something, something's missing here. You know, it's, it's, it's just like verse one. It's boring. We, we need something more. And that's when out of nowhere, these trumpets come in off, buried off to the left. That only happens that one time. There's so many things in this track that just happen once that again, we talked about restraint. When I like something, man, I want to put it in the song four or five times. And here they just happen. There's there, there sprinkles of them. And uh, it adds to the genius of the song to me. You could easily overdo it. And I could see Jellyfish being a band that gets accused of overdoing it, but I wouldn't change a single thing about this song. So much stuff happens, but it all feels necessary. None of it feels uh, just like, oh, we just threw more stuff in, threw the kitchen sink in for no reason. It all feels necessary to the song. I thought it was really funny that you talked about restraint. It's very true. Restraint is a lesson that everyone must learn. You know, as a young band, maybe the first time in the studio, now, especially in the age of Pro Tools and having every sound at your fingertips (laughs) at any moment, you got to learn restraint. But I thought that was kind of funny to hear him say that because apparently jellyfish went way over budget and time during the recording of this album spilt milk from what i've read anyway well yeah again you you couldn't fix things with a button they had to create all these sounds that takes time and sounds to me like these guys were perfectionists you know maybe 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 to a fault with uh going going over budget but but yeah just everything about this track you know i always say that a great song goes by quick and it, you know, mm-hmm. the first two and a half minutes of this song, not in a bad way. It seems like a five minute song. You're only at two and a half minutes. You still have this another minute and a half to get to four minutes on this thing, which is this whole huge interlude. And then the ending of the song, which ties it all together. And, you know, I always say this sometimes on paper, it, it should it, it looks like it shouldn't work. But here it works uh, uh, wonderfully. I mean, and I know that Roger prefaced it by saying, you know, Andy wrote the lyrics to this song but he did have some insight like into the meaning of them that i never took away from it me either i all i always thought it was just sort of like assign your own meanings to this which i'm sure they would say yeah take away your own meaning from it but i never got a necessarily a love song from it but now i get it you're my next new mistake i i can't believe i never put that together i've listened i said this is one of my favorite songs of all time but I'm just so engrossed in the music of it that I never really paid much mind. I thought the lyrics were cool, like so many cool lyrics that you wouldn't hear in a song. My sugar trampoline, you know, the whiskey and licorice, all these things that are very vivid. But I just thought they were words that sounded cool. And Chris, when he said that that outro turns into an R&B track. I'm like, oh yeah, no wonder I want, you know how much I love R&B music and I never really thought of it that way. I always thought of it as a rock song, but like I said, it's my favorite outro of all time. I could live in that. If that's what was going on in my head at all times, I'd be totally fine with that. I feel like it's 
it's just such a cool vibe. It makes me feel so good every time that part of the song hits. Yeah, and you want to talk about humble. He's about as humble as it gets. And you know, yeah. everybody in the world, he said, Justin Hawkins, and I know, I know people are uh, <laughs> k- kissing his hind end for what he did with this band because it, it was it, it was awesome. The, the, the songs stand the test of time. He was invited to the Taylor Hawkins tribute, which just goes to show you uh, what people what people think of him. He's he's so great. And I'll tell you another thing, Chris, about what people think of us. Well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> they think we're so good that they want to pay to be part of of our supporting cast over at KristaMakes.com. Yeah, man, you really turned on a dime on that one. I, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. That uh, hey, I got to. <laughs> you, you always beat me to the punch with these. I rarely, I can't get an, a word in edgewise with the after party. So I, I took my, I took my, uh, my shot. Yeah, and we had to wrap this up. This was a little bit of a longer episode, but I. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna hurry you guys up. I'd have listened to you and Roger talk for another hour. Well, that's the but, first thing I told you. I could have talked to this guy for another hour. He was. He was great. Right. Yeah. He was awesome. But yeah. Speaking of great, if, and <laughs> I don't know. Speaking, if you like podcasts, I guess I should have said. Yes, KristaMakes.com is where you can go to sign up for the Krista Makes a Podcast supporting cast and get weekly bonus episodes of the After Party plus a giant back catalog of them plus. You support the podcast that you love. Chris makes a podcast. We bring you awesome episodes like Roger Joseph Manning Jr. of Jellyfish talking about New Mistake. It's like a dream episode for me. And I freaking produced it and edited it. <laughs> I, I would have been a dream episode for me to just listen to, but I got to even do those things. That's right. And uh, thanks to everybody out there listening. We're not going away. We haven't even scratched the surface. So many great episodes coming up. And hey, I'm still doing custom songs. The holidays are upon us very soon. I got a couple slots left. So hit me up at KristaMakes at gmail.com. If you'd like me to write a song for you with that special someone or a jingle for your business or podcast, once again, that's KristaMakes at gmail.com. For more info, give me a follow on Instagram at less than Chris D. I want to thank this week's guest, Roger Joseph Manning Jr. from Jellyfish. We're sitting in with us, and we'll see you next week. Hey, this is Chris Santos, host of Delirious Nomads, the Blacklight Media Podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Delirious Nomads is a podcast about all things heavy metal, as well as breakdowns of your favorite combat sports. And me being a chef and all, we'll be riffing on some food talk every week with very special guests from across the globe. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com. Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like? Or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effing Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. Oh.